On the 16th of July 1969, NASA launched Apollo 11 from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission put a man on the moon for the very first time, winning the space race for the United States. The rocket that made it possible was Saturn V. As tall as a 36-story building, it was the most powerful that had ever flown, symbolizing American technological dominance during the Cold War. And yet, the man who designed it had a dark past. During the Second World War, he had been at the forefront of the Nazi secret weapons program, designing weapons which cost thousands of lives. Well, speaking of bombs, what is it that makes America the world's greatest nuclear power? And what is it that will make it possible for us to spend $20,000 million to put some idiot on the moon? Well, it was the great, enormous superiority of American technology, of course, as provided by our great American scientists, such as Dr. Werner von Braun. So Nazi Germany was, in some ways, very technologically advanced, but also in other areas, technologically quite behind other countries during the Second World War. Some of its advances were down to um, attempts to find ways around the Treaty of Versailles, which put lots of limitations on the German army after World War I. And the V2 is kind of an example of that, um, because in the um, 1920s, uh, the German army were looking for exotic technologies that they could develop in secret that also were not necessarily explicitly excluded from the Treaty of Versailles, and rocketry was seen as one of those. But it was definitely a mounting fear uh, amongst some of the Allied uh, kind of politicians and military planners that Germany was developing these very advanced technologies like rockets, like jet aircraft, that could potentially alter the balance of the war. Throughout the Second World War, the Allies had been using intelligence teams to steal German research and technology. Once the war came to an end, these activities increased in scope, becoming known as Operation Paperclip. And the idea originally was that it was pretty clear that Nazi Germany was you know, on the verge of being defeated, but the war in the Pacific looked like it would continue possibly for as long as another year. And so initially the goal was to use German specialists and technologies to shorten the length of the war against Japan. That changed in terms of its rationale as time went on. It also later became about um, kind of technological reparations for the cost of the war. And then ultimately it became about conflict with the Soviet Union. By 1945, the relationship between the US and Soviet Union was increasingly deteriorating. Both sides sought a technological advantage over the other, and they soon developed into a race to recruit or kidnap German scientists. And so at the end of the war, I think there's this fear amongst some of the Allied intelligence agencies that some of these specialists, if they're not recruited by the United States and Britain, and France, that they're going to be recruited by the Soviet Union, who are then also going to use their, their expertise and develop these high technologies, which are then potentially going to be directed against the Allied powers. So as much as it's about recruiting these people so that they can develop technologies for the Allies and for the United States in particular, it's also about preventing their use by the country that's emerging as this kind of new threat. At the very top of America's list was the rocket scientist, Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was this engineering wunderkind who had been obsessed with space exploration from a very young age and had, had then been involved in these early rocketry groups in Weimar Germany, done a PhD on experimental rocketry and been recruited by the German military uh, to develop rockets for them, which began with quite small rockets, but which culminated in the this 40 foot rocket, the V2, um, which is behind me. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily that his contribution was entirely his technical ability. It was more that he was the kind of overseer or one of the overseers of these programs. He was kind of the glue that held together a lot of very disparate specialists whose expertise had to be put together to make the V2 work. And work they did. The V2 travelled at supersonic speeds, giving no audible warning before impacting on its target. Around 3,000 V2s were launched during the war, particularly on London, Antwerp and Liège. Thousands of civilians lost their lives, but the death toll was even higher for the concentration camp prisoners who produced the rockets. 
around 20,000 died producing V1s and V2s during the war. Gather round while I sing you of Werner von Braun, a man whose allegiance is ruled by expedience. Call him a Nazi, he won't even frown. Nazi schmazi, says Werner von Braun. So von Braun's a very good negotiator and that's part of what makes him an effective uh, kind of leader for these huge projects. And he can obviously see by 1945 that the war is going to end and not well for Germany. And so he basically gathers together a group of uh, the specialists that he works with, gathers together a lot of documentation. And so they drive down through Germany and into Austria and they surrender to American soldiers there. And, um, you know, von Braun has obviously calculated that he, I think that he can, um, he can kind of use the leverage of his expertise and the documentation they have to negotiate a good outcome for himself and for his colleagues. Obviously their priority is not to be captured by the Russians. And so we don't know exactly then um, what he was kind of offered or what the, the kind of um, negotiations were. This marked the end of their allegiance with the Third Reich and the beginning of their integration into American scientific research. In October 1946, the USSR relocated more than 2,200 Nazi scientists and experts, along with their families, to the Soviet Union. Similar operations took place in Britain, and thousands of former Nazi scientists were recruited to services in Britain and British Commonwealth countries. The United States, meanwhile, recruited more than 1,800 scientists, evacuating them and their families to the West. When Specialists like von Braun start arriving in the US. It obviously poses the kind of problem because these people had shortly before been the enemy, and there's then this kind of issue of how to kind of represent them to the American public um, in a way that doesn't make things too difficult, doesn't raise too many complicated questions um, about what they're doing in the US. They are not keep kept secret, so Von Braun, for example, does kind of press interviews and stuff. People know him as the developer of the V2, which you know people know is a military weapon. But what is downplayed is his involvement with groups like the SS, his the strength of his kind of um, you know Nazi Party involvement the use of uh, forced labor and slave labor on the development of the V2. So I think, you know, people talk a lot about whitewashing um, that went on with these people. I think it's quite hard sometimes to say something as strong as whitewashing took place. But certainly what happened is that the American public weren't given full information about who these people were. Don't say that he's hypocritical. Say rather that he's apolitical. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? <laughs> That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. <laughs> At first, von Braun and his team were given military funding to continue their research into rocketry at Fort Bliss in Texas. Then in 1950, they were transferred to Huntsville, Alabama, where they developed the Redstone rocket. The Redstone, first launched in 1953, would become America's first ballistic missile and the first to carry a live nuclear warhead. So Von Braun, from quite soon after his arrival in the United States, um, went on something of a kind of charm offensive in terms of the public and the press. Um, and, you know, this was partly about pushing his dream of space exploration, which I do think motivated a lot of the things he did during his life, including some of the very questionable things. But it was also to some extent about rewriting his own biography. You know, he was really the shaper of his own narrative after the war about what he had done um, under Nazi Germany. And so he appeared in the press a lot as this kind of spokesperson for space technology and space development. He was profiled in Life magazine. Um, he appeared in a Walt Disney series about space travel. And so he became very quickly really like a kind of household name, you know, as much as he was a, again, a kind of engineering contributor to space technology, he was possibly more important as a kind of public advocate for what these technologies could do. This is all taking place against the backdrop of uh, the Nuremberg trials where senior members of um, the National Socialist leadership are, are being put on trial for crimes against humanity. 
and also a lot of other smaller trials that are less well remembered. So um, in 1947, there was a trial called the Dora trial, which took place at Little Baldora, which was the concentration camp where the V2 was built. And, um, you know, like a number of people who were involved in the camp were tried, uh, found guilty, one was executed. But interestingly, these people were all quite, you know, relatively minor in some ways um, to things like the V2 development program. While other people like Von Braun, of course, um, and other colleagues of his who maybe were even more implicated were not put on trial. Um, any kind of judgment about their wartime activities basically took place, if at all, behind closed doors. Von Braun would go on to work at NASA during the height of the space race. He led the development of the Saturn rockets that put men on the moon and made his dream of space exploration a reality. You too may be a big hero Once you've learned to count backwards to zero In German or English I know how to count down And I'm learning Chinese Says Werner von Braun Von Braun's story is complicated and controversial even to this day. Immediately after the Second World War, the US severely restricted the immigration of displaced people to America, including Holocaust survivors. Yet, at the same time, several thousand Nazi scientists were invited in, despite their past actions and affiliations. In 1977, Werner von Braun died of cancer at the age of 65. Upon his death, President Jimmy Carter said in a statement, to millions of Americans, Werner von Braun's name was inextricably linked to our exploration of space and to the creative application of technology. Not just the people of our nation, but all the people of the world have profited from his work. We will continue to profit from his example.